Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Our, our Father's Word, how precious it is. We're going to pick it up again today in chapter 14, kind of the deliverance of Israel, but also the doing away with the Antichrist. All right. Uh, in the close of the last lecture, in, in um, the um, fourth verse, uh, God had put, a, in, in the fifth verse, God had put a end to the wicked one, took him into captivity. And then he begins talking, as we're going to pick it up today, about trees. And it's important that you under, understand, excuse me, trees, because even from the very beginning, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil, that tree was symbolic of Satan, this being the trunk of the body and the limbs. And of course, the tree of life is always Jesus Christ, our Savior. Uh, there, there's a reason God wanted you to pay attention when he utilizes trees because he told you to learn the parable of the fig tree. And that's important because he likens that to people, if you would. And our people have always been, the, the tree symbolic of our people is the cedars of Lebanon. Why? Because it's the greatest, evergreen, you know, it, it's, um, which means eternal life if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So having said that, let's pick it up, if we may, with chapter 14, verse 8, as God is declaring he's going to start a proverb, he's destroyed the wicked one. This is kind of what people would be saying. Verse 8, that word of wisdom from our Father in the 14th chapter of the great book of Isaiah, and it reads, Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. And um, since, since you're gone, that's to say the lawless one. Now, our Father gave us, he always gives you a second witness. And you've all heard me reference uh, Ezekiel 31 concerning T. Asher. In other words, Asher is utilized in uh, the Assyrian in verse 3 of this 31st chapter, but um, it has no article. So the word should be translated not Asher, but T. Asher, which is a box cedar, a, a poorly tree. Satan thinks he's really something, but God lets him know you're nothing but a little old salt cedar. And I, I'm going to pick it up, if I may, in Ezekiel 31, verse 7. You're going to have it on the screen. Watch closely. Thus was he fair in his greatness, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. He saw to it, okay? The cedars in the garden of God, what, what gar garden of Eden? Okay. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him or from him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. God made him the full pattern. That is to say, and we're talking about the entity now, not the tree that symbolizes him. Before he fell, he was the protecting cherub. And, and God said, I made you the full pattern and that we'd have to go back to the 28th chapter to read that. I made you the full pattern, meaning full of looks, okay? Verse 9, I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches so that all the trees of Eden in the garden of, that were in the garden of God envied him. And we could go back to Adam and Eve's sin, but you're all familiar with that. We don't need to. But that's why the fig tree is so ever important, because they covered themselves with figs when they came away from the sin. Verse 10, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, you can count on it, God saying it, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height, and he hath shot up his top among the thick boughs, this is to say prideful, and his heart is lifted up in his height. In other words, he thinks he's better than anyone else. It was pride was the sin of Satan and caused him to be sentenced to death back in that 28th chapter of Ezekiel. One more verse. I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. That's to say the nations. 
he shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. And God does that. God was fed up with it. And naturally, uh, Michael himself would cast this one into the abyss, the pit, for a period of time. And we'll be getting to that right here. But God wants you to know he keeps his word. It is written, he shall ultimately uh, in time destroy the wicked one. And um, you're there, friend. So let's return then and pick it up if we may with the ninth verse of uh, Isaiah chapter 14, continuing concerning this Assyrian, okay? This, um, this false one, this lawless one. Verse nine, hell from beneath is moved for thee. Better translated the grave. The grave is opened up for you to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. The dead means the raphium, those that are already the fallen angels, the seven thousand that are already sentenced to die as it's written in Revelation chapter 11 and are held in chains for destruction as it is written in the great book of Jude in the first six verses. These raphium, check it out for yourself, okay? Even all the chief ones of the earth, it hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. And, um, and they observe and they watch. Okay. Verse 10, and they shall speak and say unto thee, art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? In other words, he was so mighty and so powerful that when, when he was cast to the abyss, the pit, his grave, He'll still be released for a short season, but there he is. They talk to him and say, are, are you, you told us you were the toughest, you were the strongest. You even named your son Jehonadab, which is to say the greatest Yah. You, apparently you're not. You're weak like we are. They're beginning to find him out. Never, never, never um, ride a dead horse and never follow a dead man. That's what Satan is. He's dead. He's already been sentenced to death, though he still has some action to do. But don't join him. Not wise. Um, let's go with the next verse. Verse um, uh, 11. The, Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of, the vi of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. And of course, this is a play on Gehenna which is the garbage pit, can't translated hell and grave in many places outside of Jerusalem where they throw uh, deceased animals and naturally the worms work in and around and cover them, maggots in other words, and so, so that you get the degradation that is intended here. He's covered with them. He's filth. Verse 12 to continue. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? You were in charge. How did you, however, could you have been so weak as this? It's important that you know, why was he called son of the morning here? Because he's the morning star. That's what the word Lucifer means to the prime. Morning star. Well, now wait, I, I thought that was what Jesus was called, was the morning star. He is. But that's what you, Satan always copies. So you got to be alert. You got to be sharp. Satan will deceive you out of your eternal rights if you allow it. He wants to be Christ. He wants to be the Savior. He wanted to sit on that mercy seat. He didn't want to protect it any longer. He really became prideful within himself. And God, you know, he was a good person apparently at one time because God elevated him to that position of the cherubim that covereth. covereth. And when he went bad, the original sin in the first earth age, he went bad big time, drawing many people with him. So he always copies. This is why he's not called Christ, but he's called 
in the Greek instead of Christ. In other words, he carries Christ's name, but it's instead of the true Christ. And that's why you read the scripture rightly dividing the word so that you know the difference between Tiasha and Asha. That is to say, you know the Assyrian, the Antichrist, from the true Christ. He'll copy, he'll cheat. But here he finally makes it. God said, I'm, I'm, we're laying him away. And of course, in, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, Michael, I'm, and I'm positive it will be Michael. I may stand corrected someday, but you'll have to wait till the millennium to do it because nobody knows for certain, but uh, Michael is in charge. He is the guardian watching, not guardian, but watching over Satan. He's, he's his jailer. He's going to put him in that abyss. And you'll read of it there in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. That's what's happened here. And the world beholds him and says, is this the one? Verse 13 to continue. For thou hast said in thine heart, you thought this to yourself, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That's the morning stars that God would put there. The angels. I will sit also up on the mount of the congregation, that's Mount Zion, in the sides of the north. Woo, woo, woo. Sides of the north is where God's altar is. What he's saying is, I'm going to take the place of God. That's a little tough because God's not going to give up that seat. Okay. But this one is so foolish that he thinks in all his beauty and in all his splendor that he can arrange this. Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And do you know something? Do you know what the real sad truth is? Many people through false teachings, when he comes and sits in that place as God, he says he's going to. God will ultimately put him in the pit, have him placed in the pit. But there, the scriptures themselves declare the events that consummate the end of this age. I'm going to take you to the New Testament where it's written exactly what happens here. How we gather back to Christ because it's a false teaching to say we're going to fly away. We got work to do here. And there's events that will transpire before we gather back to Christ. However you want to say we raise to a higher level of thinking, we raise to a higher body to gather back to him. But there are things that transpire before we get back to him. And it's biblical. And you can either believe God's word or you can be deceived by man, which usually is deceived by Satan. It's your choice. Do you believe the word of God or do you believe man? Let's go to the word of God. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, the very New Testament. Let's read it from verse 1. And it reads... Now we beseech you, brethren, what it's saying, I want you to be real careful. By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, what's the subject? The return of the Lord Jesus Christ at the second advent. Okay. And by our gathering together unto him. This is how it's done. This is how Jesus Christ comes and how we get back together with him. Oh, brother, you don't have to read any further. I've been told they blow the horn and away we fly. That's a lie. That's not what this scripture says. He's saying, be real careful, I beseech you. This is how we get together. We get back together with Christ at the second advent. Well, let, let's see what the word has to say. Verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind. Don't let somebody confuse you. Or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. That you're going to fly away. That any moment we're going to just zippo. Doesn't say that. That's not what the word says. And he says, don't let somebody confuse you with that malarkey. Okay. Listen to the word of God. 
Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. I repeat, it shall not come, except there come a falling away first. That, it, that word is apostasy. Okay. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Perdition is apollia. It's the base root of Satan's name, apollyon. 622 in your Greek dictionary. And how many men have already, what does perdition mean? It means to die. Okay. How many men are already sentenced to die? Which man of sin is sentenced to die? There's only one. There's no guesswork. It's not three guesses. You can read it in the 18th and 19th verses of the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. Satan is already condemned to die and to be turned to ashes from within. It's only one. In other words, there is no way that Jesus Christ will return to this earth until after Lucifer, son of the morning, this son of sin, the son of perdition, stands in the holy place claiming to be God. Okay. Jesus Christ will not return until after that happens. Now, what are you going to do? Well, I, I, I don't know. I've been told I won't be here. Well, somebody lied to you. Either you believe that man or you believe this word of God. It's your choice. Nobody forces you. But if I were you, I would believe the word of God. Let no man deceive you by any means, using any falsehoods. It's not going to happen until after Satan stands in Jerusalem claiming to be God, claiming to be Jesus. That's why he's called Antichrist. Verse 4, how does that happen? Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And do you know what he's going to be saying while he sits in the temple of God? I've come to rapture you out of here. Get into my bus. Hop into my bed. I want a virgin bride right here. Come with me. How many people will thinking it is God? Why? Because they haven't been told. They haven't been taught. And it's written in plain English whereby a child can understand it. But they listen to man. And man will deceive you. Let no man deceive you, but listen to the written word of God. He's going to stand there. There is no way, Christ, what this is said, there is no way that Jesus Christ is returning to us until after this fake stands in Jerusalem claiming to be God. Now let's go with the next verse. Listen, we're just, we're getting right to it here. Verse 5, remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things? We went into detail. Verse 6, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. You know to watch the Kenites. That's why Smyrna and Philadelphia were two rewarded churches because they taught who the Kenites were. We're not misled in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. <clears throat> Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now you're going to have men that will deceive you on that verse because of their ignorance of the Greek. Okay. There's, well, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. No, that's not what it says. The Holy Spirit has no article there. Well, it's talking about the church. Well, the church has no article here. Because the, the uh, noun is transitive. The verb, rather, is transitive. Well, just what does that mean? Well, it means that you have to transfer the action to, uh, to, as to who we're talking about, who lets, and who will be taken out of the way. Back to verse 4, 5, and 6. Well, who was it talking about there? Satan. And, but who holds Satan? That's what's important. That's why I said Michael is the one that casts him into the pit. Because it is Michael in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. 
along with his angels who cast Satan and his angels out on this earth when he sits in Jerusalem claiming to be God. Only he will be there until Michael decides to let him out of heaven and on to earth. And Michael will control him. But many in this earth will be deceived because his message is, I've come to rapture you out of here. Come to save you. He's always wanted to be the Savior. And it would bear you well in mind to remember Ezekiel chapter 13 again, verse 18 and through 20, when Jesus, through the Father, the Father through the Son, would say, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. Why? Because God's outreaching arms are there for you to save you whereby you're not deceived, where you're not lied to. But if you want to involve yourself in the traditions of men that make void this word, then hey, have a good trip. But know beforehand there's a price for it. Verse 8, listen carefully. And then shall that wicked be revealed, identified, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, which is the word, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That is to say, the coming of the true Christ. Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. Why? Because he is Satan. All right. With all powers and signs and lying wonders, I'm going to fly you away. That's the lying wonder of falsehood. What again are we talking about here? I want to talk to you about our gathering back to Christ. It's not going to happen until Satan stands in Jerusalem claiming he's coming to fly you out of here, to lying to you, working miracles. Verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They'd rather be misled. Why? Why would you want to listen to man and his traditions rather than reading? Let, let your grade school student read this to you and ask them how they understand it. Verse 11 to complete here. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. If you want to deceive yourself, God says, hey, have to it. If you, after I write you this letter of love, warning you and telling you exactly how Satan's going to operate, that morning star, great importance. And if you, if you choose to go ahead and fly in any doctrine. You know, what do you put the gospel armor on in, uh, in place for? To stand against the fiery darts of Satan, not to flit, not to fly, but to stand in, in the field, this earth, doing God's work against these lies and this corruption. Yep, and there he is claiming to be God, both verified in both the Old and the New Testament. Has it been taught in your church? Uh, have you heard it recently? I'm not judging, but I am a teacher of the Word of God. And God's Word is what church is supposed to be about. It is the mouth and the tongue of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the living Word. There is nothing that complicated about it when you listen to His Word and not cloud it or cumber it with the traditions of man. Returning then to Isaiah chapter 14, and we'll pick it up with verse 15, when he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit in, I'm going to be on the side of the north in God's place and God's throne, and I'll be God. What does God do about that? Verse 15, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. You're going into the abyss. Verse 16, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, 
is this the man that Revelation chapter 13, verse 18 spoke of? They said, here is the number of a man. It is 600, three score and six, 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 six. The one that comes at this, get this, how simple. The one that comes at the sixth seal, the sixth trump and the sixth vial. Not the seventh, that's the true Christ. But he that comes before and not until, and, uh, and let no man deceive you that this man, it's not even Adam, it's ish in the Hebrew tongue, this word man. As they look, uh, which means what? When Michael cast him into the pit through the millennium, that thousand year reign where people are taught the truth, he's locked away. But they can still see him. Is this, we went for that? We listened to his lies? and the lies of men that would promote him and were deceived away from the true Christ? Yep, you got it. God's elect will teach in that day of the Lord, which is that thousand year period. Revelation 20, verse one, where Michael cast him into the grave, the abyss, the pit. Verse 17. That this one, is he the one that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners? Didn't give anybody a chance to learn truth. Keep those lies poured on. Keep it on. Verse 18, all the kings of the nations, even all of them lie in glory, every one in his own house. In other words, um, each one of them in his own grave, they, they're buried usually with honor, but there's no honor to this one in the pit. Verse 19, but thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch of the box cedar, the branch of, of, of Ezekiel 31. And as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with the sword, that go down to the stones of the pit, of the pit that's the, as a corcus trodden under feet, uh, kind of a state of degradation for him to end his reign. Very deserving. Verse 20, thou shalt not be joined with them in burial. They're not gonna respect you because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people, the seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. In other words, um, I'm, I'm going to cut off your people, you and all of your people. Verse 21, prepare slaughter for his children, for the iniquity of their fathers that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. Cain was a city builder. That was what he was, that joined house onto house. What God is saying here, if they're at, but come with me now. He's been cast into this abyss on the first day of the, of the millennium, the Lord's day. And through that period, and at the very end, when he's released a short season, God said, we're going to destroy every one of them that still follow him. But at the same time, I want to make it very clear that if a Kenite, if one of Satan's children decides to love the Lord Jesus Christ and converts, they no longer fit this genealogy, but are a child of God because God opens salvation to whomsoever will. And that leaves that door open even to Satan's very own. But those who wait till the last hour, that's to say at the end of the millennium, the millennium, the Lord's day, when they are all in spiritual bodies and no better, I say again, will no better. If they choose to hang on to him, God says, that's it that wipes it, destroy them, do them away. It's over. Why? And because there's not going to be anything that offends after that. And we don't have room for decep de deception or those that bring it, deceivers. 
We want truth and we will have truth. God is the truth. Verse 22, for I will raise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, that's emphatic, that I, I will raise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon, confusion. The name and remnant and son and nephew, saith the Lord, all of them. Again, that's very emphatic. That time does come, and it doesn't come until the very last day of the millennium. It's called the Great White Throne Judgment Day. It will end many things. Many things shall end. What a beautiful day that will be for God's uh, children, though. Verse 23, again emphatic, I will also make it a possession of the bittern, that's the waterfowl, okay, and pools of water and I will sweep it with the besom. Besom would be the equivalent of our broom corn. Not exactly broom corn, but a plant that they made and used for brooms to sweep with. I will sweep it with the besom, the brooms of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. It won't be anymore. That's good news, friend. That's beautiful, wonderful news that our Father ends that that offends, that He ends this one that uh, brings all this bitterness and all this sadness upon our people. He's finally, our Father emphatically brings this to an end, brings it to a close. How precious that's going to be. It is written it shall come to pass as it is written. Let no man deceive you. Christ shall not return to this earth until after this son of perdition, the false morning star, the Antichrist sits in Jerusalem on a throne claiming to be God to carry people away. See that you're not sucked up in it. Do you understand now better Mark 13 when it says the first one taken from the field? He was taken by who? By the false Christ. You don't want to be that first one taken by this deceiver. See that you understand our Father's word. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment. Won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD.